Revelation chapter 6. I found something uh, the other morning. I didn't sleep Friday night after we got home. It's probably Steve's fault. But I didn't sleep. And uh, so I'm going back and forth reading my Bible and looking at some other things. And there was something I, kn- I knew a long time ago and I forgot about it. And you know me, I don't like to leave anything out. If it's in here, we're going to dig it out. And it's in relation to Revelation 6. It's something, believe it or not, that Jesus said from the cross. And you have to understand this. What is crucifixion? Well, for Jesus, it was about a nine-hour episode of choking to death. Okay? It's about a nine-hour episode long episode of choking because the strain of your arms and your body weight pulling on your arms like this for hours compresses the lungs and you can't breathe and the heart the pericardium fills up with fluid because you're going into cardiac arrest but takes all, think about him being up there all day long for nine hours and um, he has the ability to say these profound things like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And what I'm going to show you this morning, Revelation 6, verse 12, And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Imagine what that would do to the earth. On that day, the sun now is blocked or not shining on the earth. It's not shining. There is no solar radiation. There is no heat from the sun reaching the earth. It takes about 90 minutes from light from the sun to reach the earth. So from the time this event occurs... 90 minutes later on the earth, it's going to start doing what? First of all, it's going to get dark. Then what's going to happen? It is going to start getting not cold, it's very cold. It will impact every weather system in the world. Because weather systems are driven by the sun, the seas, and the wind. When you alter one of them, you alter the rest. They're all united. I mean, think of those three, these three as one. Think of those three together. And when those are altered, when one of them's altered, you're going to alter the rest of them. And the weather systems in the earth are going to go nuts. Okay? And then the stars of the heaven fell into the earth, even as the fig tree cast their untimely figs. I want you to think of a tree. Because Jesus is going to reference that from the cross when she has shaken up a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as the scroll went in his roll together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth, the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man. Watch this now. This is, this is where we're going. Hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And you think about that. Because we're going to go to the cross here in a minute. And here is this event in history where Christ is laying down the sacrifice, the one and only accepted sacrifice to God for the sins of mankind. God does not accept our sacrifice. God does not accept that crazy, mystical, magical wizardry that's performed in the Catholic Church. He does not accept that. He does not take your money. He does not, God said, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. If I wanted to eat, I can eat whatever I want. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need your money. 
Keep your gifts, is what he said. But anyway, Christ is going to, he's offering this sacrifice, but he's also warning now, he's going he's to prophesy from the cross. And he's going to warn them about a day that is coming. And he's going to do it from the cross. Said to the mountains, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So the world on this day is going to recognize that the wrath of God is approaching. All right? So now, turn to Luke 23. Luke 23. Open your Bibles to underline this, and then put a mark in your Bible, linking it back. You can write Revelation 6. You can write 6 Thiel on there. Uh, so far, we've looked at... Um, Go back a little bit. We looked at Isaiah 13 a couple weeks ago. Um, Mark 13, Matthew 24, Isaiah 34. All of these are referenced uh, and I think summarized in Revelation 6. So Luke 23, 27. There followed him a great company of people and of women which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turning unto them said, he's on his way to the cross, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Not just your first generation, but all of your generations past you. Because it didn't happen in the very next generation. It didn't happen in their children of the first generation. It ha it's going to happen later on. It hasn't happened yet. And he says in verse 29, For behold, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Jesus, in Matthew 24, warned about this day when he said, Woe to them that uh, are giving suck in those days. Woe to them who are with child. Because, because it's like Courtney coming in with her little baby. Uh, she's got a lot on her hands. And a lot on her mind with him. And then there comes a day when the wrath of God is going to be poured down from heaven. And Jesus prophesies a woe to the earth and those who have little children in those days. And he says here, blessed are the barren, blessed are the women who, have not, who don't have children to worry about. Verse 30, why? Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills cover us. That is exactly what we just read in Revelation 6. Exactly. For if, these, for if they do these things, remember what I told you about the fig tree. If they do these things, in a green tree. What is a green tree? Evergreen. Fruit. That's a baby. He's a fruit, Courtney. He's a peach. Um, I, I do. I think it has to do with a, a green tree bears fruit. It's, it's alive. It's going to bear nuts. It's going to bear acorns. It's going to bear seed. It's going to bear fruit. Whatever, whatever tree it is, it's going to do that. What shall be done in the dry? A dry tree is a dead tree. It's a, it's a barren womb. It's not fruitful. It doesn't, it doesn't bring forth anything. It's just sitting there, waiting to fall on your house. We had a, 
we got a tree up back of the church, and I rolled in here several months ago, and the wind was blowing, and I heard that thing going, and I'm looking at it, and it's leaning right over the playground back there. And I told John, I said, we need to get somebody out here to cut that thing down. So we hired a guy. He just showed up a week late, is all. Because I pulled in here a couple weeks ago one morning, George. Sure enough, the very part of the tree that I figured was going to fall, it snapped and fell right on that fence back there. Didn't hurt the fence, I don't think. But sure enough, it did. And I'm going... Oh, I rarely get things like this right. But I guess you don't need to be a rocket scientist to hear a tree. But I think that's what he's referring to. Now, there may be, there are other references to green trees in the Bible. And I can tell you, and I, I don't know the connection yet. I studied them out years ago. It's been a long time since I looked at it. But if you just want to write this down, do your own study later. Study green tree, green trees. Green, um, the, the groves, which you can actually drive through Festus and Crystal City and still see them today. And what are they in Festus and Crystal City? It's Mary in an old iron bathtub, halfway stuck in the ground. That's the grotto, that's the idol, that's the fertility goddess. Mary is a fertility goddess. And she's surrounded by plants and flowers and trees and shrubs and everything else. They always put Mary in a grove. A grove of trees, a grove of plants. When Josiah became king, what's the first thing he did? Cut down the groves. He said, we're getting rid of them. And I have a theory about this. If you want to know it. You want, you want me to tell you? I have a theory about it. What lives, in, what lives in and around trees? Name off some things that live in and around and on trees. Squirrels, owls, birds, insects. A squirrel. Okay. Keep... Give me some more. Snakes, possums, raccoons, everything, right? Animals, beasts, but not people. People don't live in the woods. We cut the woods down so we can live. That's what we do. And the analogy is, and I, and I think I'm right on this, the Druid priest of England, 800,000 years ago, before Christianity really settled in, well, it probably goes back farther than that. Well, like 1,500 years ago in Britain, the Isle of Britain, Scotland, Ireland, the, um, those Druid priests always worshipped around trees, specifically oak trees. The concept was, was that their god lived inside of the tree. Now follow me on this. So, a very skilled artisan would take the tree, cut it down, and he would cut the trunk off, and he would start with his tools, and he would start chiseling on that trunk of that tree until finally, in a few months, he had, guess what? A god. See it? They weren't wrong, were they? They believed that their God lived inside of that tree, and it was up to them to set him free, to release him from the bonds of being hidden inside that tree. So it took the skill, and God told about this in Jeremiah. Man, one man cutteth down a tree, another man taketh his square and his compass. Think about those tools. And his tools, and he carves out a tree. And he doesn't think now, he doesn't think that the same tree he cut this God out of, and he's worshiping and praying to this stick, 
is the same tree that he took the branches off of and cut them up, used them for firewood to throw in his stove to bake bread with. Or to make a shelf with. Or to build his house with. God said, they're so dumb and they're so stupid, they don't realize it's just a stinking tree. It's just a piece of wood, it's all it is. And yet they're bowing to it as if it has some magic powers. And God said, it doesn't. I'm the only one that has the power. Somebody say amen. Now turn to Joel, not Osteen. Joel, not Osteen. Uh, we were going through free channels on our Roku because we're getting rid of our satellite dish, we think. So we were going through free channels because we're hoggards and we're cheap. And sure enough, the Osteen channel showed up. I didn't subscribe. Joel 2, 28. Boy, I could read, I could stand here and go all day and just teach on Joel. Joel is a, an amazing, to me it's an amazingly clear book. It's not like the last six chapters of Daniel. Last six chapters of Daniel, I need a university PhD degree to even read it. But Joel's pretty clear to me. Um, that's the first sermon that Peter preached was from right here. And it, it references, uh, and it, in Joel 1, he warns there's going to be an attack on your land. And you've never seen anything like this. You've never seen it. Your fathers haven't seen it, but you're going to tell your children. Their children are going to tell their children. Their children are going to tell it down to the fourth generation. They're going to tell them and warn them about this army that's going to attack. And in Joel 1, he tells them, you drunkards, you wake up. Sober up. Get right. Because I'm sending a nation to you that you will not be able to defeat. And he said, it's going to bark Watch this. Look at verse 7 of chapter 1. He has laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. That's exactly the tree mentioned in Revelation 6. When you bark a fig tree, what is, it turns a green tree into a dry one. Dead tree. So he had, when, you, when, you bark, when you tear the bark off a tree, this is like peeling the skin off a person. Do they live long after that? So that's, that's the picture. And there's a fast. And he's talking about, alas, for the day of the Lord. Now chapter 2, blow the trumpet. Now this is, to me, that signifies the, the seven trumpets that are blown. And it's the day of the Lord. Verse 2, it's a day of darkness and gloominess, day of clouds and thick darkness. Study that phrase out, day of clouds. When's the Lord coming? In the clouds. It's his day. And it references a great people and a strong. That hath never been the like. So what does that tell you? It tells you that this army, this nation, has never been here. But they're coming. Okay? They don't live here. It's not Ireland. It's not Canada. It's not the Norwegians. They don't. They're not from here. It's what it's telling you. They have the appearance of horses. Everything in Joel and their appearance matches Revelation 9 and their appearance. Everything, the details, all of them right there. So now in verse 28, he says, And it shall come to pass. Oh, i got to read that verse before that, verse 27. I like this. I like this phrase. And you'll see it all through the Bible especially the Old Testament, because Israel has never really known their God. Not really. They have been introduced to their God. They have received their God's commandments. They've seen their God's miracles. And they have, at times, worshipped their God, but they've never really known their God. 
In fact, Jews to this day will not even say the word God. They won't say it. They won't even write it out. They will put a G, a line, and a D. But they will not. I'm not making this up. I, they will not. A real Jew will not reference nor speak nor write the name or the word of God. They will not do it. It's the commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So the best way to not take God's name in vain is to not ever say God's name. That's how legalistic they are. God didn't say that he, that they could not speak his name. He didn't say that to them. He just said, don't do it in vain. But they don't know who their God is. They don't know that their God's name is Jesus Christ. They've been introduced to him. He was their high priest. He was their prophet. He was their lawgiver. He was their rock that the water came from. He was the bread that came down from heaven. He was the lamb that they sacrificed at the Passover. He was, he was everything in the Old Testament, but they didn't know who he was. He was the river Jordan. He was the water that came down from heaven. He was everything in the Old Testament, but they didn't know who he was. And they still don't know. And God always promises all through the Old Testament. He's going to do wondrous things among them. He's going to do some harsh things to them. But I can tell you, having been on the receiving end of both the harsh things of God and the wondrous things of God, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that they have made me understand who my God is. I know who my God is. So he says in verse 27, you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. What did Jesus say? Where two or more are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. In the book of Revelation chapter 1, when John hears the voice behind him, he turns, he looks, he sees seven golden candlesticks. Those are the seven stars, they're the seven churches. And he sees one in the midst of them. And it's the Son of God. He's in the midst of his people. In the tabernacle. The tabernacle was always set down first when they traveled. And then the 12 tribes. Judah, always to the east. God didn't just say, pick a spot you like, park anywhere you want. If, if you were in a particular tribe, you had to stay amongst your people. Judah always to the east, Dan always to the north, always. And when they left, it was always Judah that led the way. Dan was the tail. He was always the last. And that has everything to do with why he's not mentioned in Revelation 7 in the list of the 144,000. Dan is gone. Okay? But he says, um, you shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people, listen to this, shall never be ashamed. Anybody here ever been ashamed before? Yep. And isn't it great to live a life that you don't have to be ashamed of. I'd take this life over any of them. Now in verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. So here is God laying out an order. He says, first you're going to know that I am the Lord your God. I'm in the midst of you. You shall know, you, you're going to know me. And then afterward. And this is what Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. That I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and there's two of these events two of them the first one in the book of acts chapter 2 because we're going to read this your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids the women even women god says in those days will i pour out my spirit so that happened on the day of Pentecost. In this church, man, woman alike. 
can have the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, in them, abiding in them, teaching them, guiding them, training them, taking them through the journey of life that we're on. Lead, it's the light that guides our way. That happened on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Here's what didn't happen on that day. Now will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. That did not happen on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So does this event not mean anything? Did God just make this up? Does he not intend to fulfill this? No, he intends to fulfill it at a later time. Israel, Israel will receive the seal of God in their foreheads. And according to Ephesians, the seal of God is the Holy Spirit. It's the earnest of our inheritance. He says in um, Joel 3.16, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion. Oh, I like this. Turn to... Revelation, you guys always should know to not just look at the screen, because I'm not going to put everything up on the screen for you. I'm going to go off script. Revelation 10. And look at here. Look at here what I got to do here. This is Revelation 9 here. I got to be real careful. Shh. Revelation 10. What did we just read? Joel 3.16. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion. Revelation 10. Who is this? I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as of the sun, his feet as pillars of fire. And he laid his hand at... And he had in his hand a little book open. He set his right foot upon the sea, his left foot on the earth. That's dominion. And he cried with a loud voice. How? As when a lion roareth. And let me explain that. It's not a roar. It's not that. It's not one of those lion roars. When you go to YouTube and watch lion videos, watch lion videos. Learn their nature. Because your mind will just go, that is amazing. A male lion who is the head of a pride, he'll have three or four female lions, and he'll have his cubs. All of those female lions bore that male lion's cubs, and he is the dominant male. He might have a brother with him, but that brother does not get to breed with those females. Okay? He is a, he's a dry lion, unless the brother kills the older brother and takes over the pride. And when he does kill the dominant lion, the other lion will then kill the cubs, the lion cubs, because he's not going to have some other lion's progeny under his feet. He's going to destroy that lion's seed forever. Cut it off. And this one lion now will be in charge and there is a lot you can get from that but let me explain what this roar is every now and then the lion the male lion is the laziest animal ever created by god if he's the one in charge of the pride because he recognizes all he has to do is lay down on his back and go and wait for the female lions to get hungry enough to go out and kill a gazelle and drag it back and then start eating on it. And the male lion wakes up, runs all them off, and he lays there and he eats on that gazelle until he's full. And when he's done, then the cubs and the women can come back. Sounds like some men I know. But that male lion, come on in here. That male lion will wake up every now and then, sometimes in the middle of the night, because it really carries at night. And he'll stand up on his all fours, and he'll lower his neck out like this, and he'll go, ooh, ooh, 
Woo! Like that. And they said that'll carry sometimes 10 miles through the woods. And what that does is that signifies to every animal and every lion and everything within earshot of that lion, if you can hear my voice, this land is mine. And no other. I'm not giving it up. And if you are an animal or another lion and you hear that low grunt coming out in the middle of the night, the hair is going to stand up on your hackles and you're going to have the fear thing in you and you're going you're to run because you just were told this land doesn't belong to you. It's mine. That, to me, the Lord shall roar out of Zion. Zion is his hill. And he's not, listen, he's not going to give it up to anybody else. Can I hear you say amen? All right. Oh, I'm glad you could join us. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, this book, I keep saying it, I can't say it enough. It's everything. Everything in life that we need, everything in life we need to learn, everything in life that has happened, is happening now, will happen, is right, right here. This is my life in one book. And I pray God teach it to us throughout the course of our lives. Help us to learn it, apply it, use it, share it, memorize it, meditate on it, pass it around. Bless it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.